Well, uh, good morning again, and uh, welcome to church. Welcome to church at the Grove, and if you are uh, here with us this morning, we just want to say thank you for spending part of your weekend here with us, and uh, I want to say a special welcome, too, for the very first time uh, in Church at the Grove history. We are also streaming live from Social Circle, so good morning. If you're watching from online this morning, welcome to Church at the Grove. We're so glad that you're with us this morning as well, and here at Church at the Grove, we want people to get connected, um, so it's not just about um, filling a seat or watching something online, but it's actually about being connected in the life and in the body of Church at the Grove, and one of the easiest ways, especially if you're a guest or a visitor with us that we would love to connect with you is by filling out our encounter card, and uh, you can do this through our Church at the Grove app. If you're here in person, you can scan the little QR code in front of you or send, uh, fill out a physical form at the connection desk on your way out. If you're online, you can click the link that's right there right now, but we would love to be able to connect with you, not to show up at your house unannounced, but just to have a record of your visit, to send you a gift this week in the mail, and just to say thank you for being part of our services, but also give you some resources um, to help you take some next steps. <clears throat> excuse me, next steps in your faith journey. And so we'd love to partner with you in that. But if you're just joining us this morning, we're in the uh, end of a series called Breakthrough. And uh, we've been talking about how we can experience breakthrough in our lives. And I think that that's something that we all... excuse me, all would really want to have in our lives. We would all want to see breakthrough happen in our lives. Ultimately, we see more stagnation in our lives, and we see lives that are full of just kind of stalled out faith, where we're just kind of going through the motions. We're running on the hamster wheel, but we don't feel like we're ever making any forward progress. But we want to see breakthrough in our lives. And so this whole series has really revolved around this idea that breakthrough happens when we're living in intentional biblical community, that that's ultimately what our lives should be about, that we should strive to have men and women of faith that surround us, that are helping us achieve the ways that God wants us to live in life. And so the first week of this series, we looked at an Old Testament story of Moses, and it's this incredible story of him going into battle. It's the first battle that the Israelites take on, and Moses, as long as his hands are lifted high, the Israelites are winning the battle, and his arms eventually get tired, and so there's a man named Aaron and a man named Hur, and they come alongside Moses, and they lift his hands up for him. When he gets tired, when he gets weak, they're there to support him, to lift his arms up, to support support him in the midst of his struggle and in his burden. And we said that that's ultimately what uh, the community of faith around us should do, that they should support us, that they should be with us, they should lift our hands up when we're struggling, they should pray for us and with us, and they should be there to support us and guide us on our faith journey. Last week, we talked about the story of Gideon, which is an incredible Old Testament passage that talks about how God took this huge army and he whittled it down to just a few. And we said that God uses small groups of weak people to accomplish breakthrough in our lives, that ultimately when God begins to whittle things down in our lives and he brings us into smaller gatherings, he exposes our weaknesses, but it's also an opportunity for us to depend upon him all the more. And so this morning, as we kind of close out this series, I want us to really evaluate the importance of uh, seeing who we are listening to in life. Um, Because who we are listening to in life ultimately determines the future for our lives. Um, I can remember when I was in high school, um, I came to know Jesus the summer before my junior year in high school. And uh, then I went to school that year, and uh, I got partnered up um, with a lot of the same friends. We had to switch classes, and so we had a lot of the same friends that were in each of the classes. And so I was partnered up with uh, some of the more kind of popular kids in school. And so, you know, like every school kind of has the different classes. So there's like the super athletic people, the jock types, which I certainly did not fit in that category. There's the creative artsy types that, that were sit all together in the lunchroom. They're always together. Um, you know, there's the brainiacs, the super smart kids that are all in the top top 10 of their class, and they're all together. And then there's kind of more of the popular crowd. And I didn't really fit in any of those categories. But this year, for whatever reason, I started to have friendships with more of the kind of popular kids in the class. 
And, and so we began to hang out during class, which eventually took us outside of classes into study groups and different things like that. And then eventually there were friendships and stuff that were developing that we were hanging out every night and on the weekends, and we were doing all kinds of things that we probably shouldn't have been doing. And uh, these friendships began to develop, and it felt really great because for the first time, I was in the popular class, which, you know, I know looking at me, you're thinking, wait, you weren't always in the popular class, right? Like, that's know what you're thinking. I get that. I totally understand. But I'm, I know it's shocking, but I'm not the most witty. I'm not the most fashionable. I'm not the most outgoing. And so I wasn't in this type of class of people. So it really meant a lot because these people before this year, like, they didn't even know who I was. They didn't know my name, right? And now all of a sudden they're taking notice. We're hanging out and we're actual friends, and new opportunities were presented to me where I had, you know, different parties and drugs and alcohol were presented to me. And I had tons and tons of opportunities that were handed to me on a silver platter. And I began to kind of move in this direction. Even though I was a follower of Jesus, even though I loved Jesus deeply, I was beginning to drift away from Jesus and follow the ways and the influence that this crowd had over me. And it wasn't until probably closer to the end of my junior year that this girl who was a friend of mine, she pulled me to, a, to the side and she said, Nathan, um, uh, I got to have a conversation with you. Um, you can't continue to live the way that you're living. Um, you have kind of one foot in the way of following Jesus and you've got one foot in the way of following the world and you can't have it both ways. You got to decide which way are you going to go. And in the moment, I hated that conversation. I hated hearing her say these things to me. But in my looking back, I know that what she was saying was true, was right. And I'm so thankful for the conversation that took place that day. It was a wake-up call for me because I knew that I couldn't continue to live the way that I was because I was going down the wrong path. The people that I was surrounding myself with, the people that had influence over my life were leading me in a direction that I ultimately didn't want to go. And we've all known this, right? We all have had these types of relationships in our lives where we've had people that have influenced us, that have maybe, maybe it's been for the good, maybe it's been for the bad, but we've all had people that have influenced us. Jim Rohr, he said that we are the average of our five closest friends. So think about that for a second. Think about the five people that you hang out with the most. Maybe it's coworkers, maybe it's your husband, your wife, maybe it's a friendship of some kind. You are the average of those five relationships, those five people combined. That's who you are. That's who you're going to become is what his hypothesis is. There's actually been research that has been done that actually goes even further than this. In the New England Journal of Science and Medicine, recently there was a research that was done that said, not only are you the uh, average of the five people that you spend the most time with, but there's also been health studies that have shown that you also are influenced not just by your friends, but the friends of your friends. Listen to this. It said that the longest and largest running health studies show that if a friend of yours becomes obese, you yourself are 45% more likely to gain weight over the next two to four years. So if you want to be thin, don't be friends with overweight people is what I hear you from that. So um, don't be friends with me, I guess, is what we're saying. So um, here we go. So 45% more likely to gain weight over the next two to four years. But this is the shocking thing they found. They also found that if a friend of your friend becomes obese, the likelihood of gaining weight increases by about 20%, even if you don't know the friend of the friend. The same thing true, proved to be true when it came to smoking. If a friend of yours smokes, you are 61% more likely to become a smoker yourself. If a friend of yours friend smokes, you are 29% more likely to smoke. So it's a negative influence, but there's also positive things that come from this. Perhaps the most telling thing about the study was the idea of happiness. The two researchers found that happy friends make you happier. No surprise there. But if your friend of a friend of a friend, so three generations away from you, if they are happy with their life, then you are a 6% greater likelihood of being happy yourself. That's a 6%. doesn't sound like a lot, but there's other studies that suggest that if I gave you a $10,000 raise, that would only trigger your happiness percentage by 2%, which many of y'all would maybe disagree with that, right? You'd be a lot happier if you had $10,000 more a year. But what the study is ultimately showing and proving to be true is that the people that we surround ourselves with 
influence us. They lead us in the direction that we're going to go in our lives. Who we hang out with, who we associate with, who we're listening to ultimately determines the direction that we're going to go and the direction that we're going to move in life. We could say it this way. This is our big idea for the morning, that whoever has your ear guides your heart. Whoever has your ear, whoever you're listening to, is the one that is ultimately going to be the one responsible for guiding your heart in the direction that you are going to go in life. This is why it's so important for us to evaluate our friendships and the influences that we have in our lives. This matters if you're in middle school and high school where middle schoolers, man, we'll just listen to anybody, right? And we'll just kind of go in anybody that talks to us, anybody that accepts us, that's who we're going to listen to. But it also matters in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. Anytime someone has our ear, they have the ability to guide our heart. And so this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to be challenged to evaluate our friendships, to evaluate the influences that are speaking into our lives, that we would see who has my ear and ultimately who is guiding my heart. Now, we're going to look at this Old Testament story that's a real obscure passage. If you um, have read through the Bible, you probably have forgotten about this story because it's not a huge story in the grand scheme of things throughout Scripture. It's found in the book of 2 Chronicles. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there and feel free to use your table of contents to find the book. But 2 Chronicles is an account of the kings and the priests of Israel, and it kind of gives the history behind their stories. Fascinating book. Um, but this, in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, um, there's a story of a man named Joash. And his story is bonkers. Like it is, it is crazy when you begin to set the scene for Joash and his family. It's a dysfunctional family indeed. There's uh, Queen Jezebel, which Jezebel is not just one of the most evil queens that ever lived. She's one of the most evil individuals in all of Scripture. And she has a daughter named Athaliah. And she has a son named Ahaziah. And so there's the family genealogy right there. And Ahaziah is the king at the time. He dies, and his mom proceeds to kill the entire royal family. She kills all all the descendants of Ahaziah so that she can become the ruler of Judah. So it's this wicked, evil practice where she kills off babies and and children so that they won't be able to take the throne and that she can take the throne that she believes to be hers. Well, there's this other family member, her sister actually, who has this smart idea of hiding this newborn baby infant, infant named Joash. And it, she takes Joash and she hides him in the temple and she hides him there for seven years. And the grandmother doesn't even acknowledge him. She forgets about him. She doesn't even know he's there. And at the end of seven years, they finally bring him out of hiding. They present him to the captain's guards, and they give him the kingship, and they end up killing his grandmother, the queen, who has taken over the nation at this time. So it's like a blockbuster movie just waiting to happen and waiting to be made. But this is the scene that Joash comes into. Joash, at the age of seven, is going to become the king, the ruler of the nation of Judah. Now listen, that's scary. I've got a six-year-old. And, uh, and I love him to death, but man, like I can't trust him to do a whole lot, much less read uh, or lead a nation, right? We can't probably do that. Maybe there's a lot of growing that happens between your sixth year and your seventh year. I don't know, but this is how he starts his life. He, at seven years old, is going to become the ruler and the king of Judah. And obviously, as he has no parents, he's an orphan, there's a guy named Jehoiada. And Jehoiada is a priest. And he's going to kind of become a father figure for Joash and lead him in a way that is upstanding, in a way of integrity, a way that is going to lead him closer to the Lord. Listen to how it starts in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, starting in verse 1. It says this, Joash was seven years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother was Zebiah from Beersheba. Joash did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight throughout the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada chose two wives for Joash, and he had sons and daughters. 
So Joash, as this young man, seven years old, taking over this authority, this huge place of power, Jehoiada comes alongside of him and begins to train him and guide him and lead him in the direction that he needs to go. And it even says right there in verse two that he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight as long as Jehoiada was alive. And that's exactly what happens. Joash gets this idea in his head that he's going to restore the temple of God. It had been polluted by these foreign and pagan idols and gods. And Joash is going to not just restore the temple by rebuilding it and bringing in, uh, you know, all the different artifacts that needed to be in there, but it's also a religious reform. So it's not just a building project that Joash is coming into, but it's also a religious kind of revival because they're ridding themselves of the idols and the pagan worship. And they're beginning to put God in his rightful place as the leader and as the king and as the Lord and savior of the nation of Jesus. Judah. And so this is a miraculous thing. This young boy is chosen and used in such a miraculous way. His leaders and the people that have come before him were wicked and evil, and he doesn't have a good example. But yet Joash, because of Jehoiada's influence, is able to repair or restore the temple and lead the nation into religious revival and reform only because he was listening to the voice of Jehoiada. Jehoiada was speaking into his life, and as a result, he was making wise decisions that honored the Lord. It says in verse 13, it says, The men in charge of the renovations worked hard and made steady progress. They restored the temple of God according to its original design and strengthened it. When all the repairs were finished, they brought the remaining money to the king and and Jehoiada, It was used to make various articles for the temple of the Lord, articles for worship, services, and for burnt offerings, including ladles and other articles made of gold and silver. And the burnt offerings were sacrificed continually in the temple of the Lord during the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. So again, it's a building project that he takes over, but it's also religious reform that happens as the people turn their hearts back to the one true God. Now listen, At Church at the Grove, uh, we've gone through really just one major building project. We built our Walnut Grove campus. And uh, I'll just be honest with you, as great as it is to have a building, it's not fun, right? When you have to kind of come up with this vision and you've got to get in front of people and you've got to talk about money and you've got to get everybody on the same page and you've got to get people to give generously and stuff, like that's not an easy ask, right? A lot of times people go, you know what? Like, you know, we're we're leaving. We don't care about this. We're not doing that. And it's just a hard process to do a building building project by itself. But Joash is not just doing a building project, but he's also leading religious reform and revival. And so there's just a supernatural kind of thing that's happening, but it's all coming at the hands and at the influence of Jehoiada speaking into his life. And this is what I want us to understand, that whoever has our ear guides our heart, but then also that if we're listening to the right voices, that unlimited potential is possible in our life. Unlimited potential is possible in our life if we're listening to the right voices. Um, I listen to tons and tons of podcasts. I don't know if there's any podcast people out there, but I'll probably listen to a dozen different podcasts a week. And one of the ones that I'll make a regular practice of listening to is one called How They Built This. Have have anybody ever heard this? No one? No one? All right. Uh, NPR does it, and it's really great. They, They interview all of these business leaders that started companies and organizations. Some of them are smaller. Some of them are larger. Some of them are airline companies that you would have heard of or computer companies you would have heard of. And some of them are smaller that maybe might not be household names. And he interviews them really talking about the conception of the idea to where they are today. And it's so interesting because every single one of the stories you listen to, there's always incredible obstacles that they have to overcome. Where the health code, uh, health food department, they come in and they say, hey, we're shutting your restaurant down because you didn't jump through these hoops or because, you know, something else happened. And so their business is shut down. Or the investor that said that they were going to give so much money doesn't come through and they don't get the money that they thought was going to happen and come through with, or, or that there's some copyright infringement that happens. And so they have to throw away an idea and come up with a new idea. Like there's all of these incredible obstacles that they have to come up with. And almost in every single one of those stories, you'll hear the guy ask, and he'll, they'll be telling the story, the, the people being interviewed, and they'll say, man, I was about to give up, but then someone said, you've come too far. Someone said, don't give up. Someone said, there's another way. There's got to be another way that we can go. 
And if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for her, if it wasn't for my business partner, if it wasn't for my mom, if it wasn't for my dad, then I wouldn't be where I am today. This is the power of the right voices speaking into our lives. But now here at church, what we're talking about is not that we would just listen to good advice. I want us to hear this. This is not just listening to good advice. I think that for so long we've settled for listening to good advice at the expense of listening to godly advice. And those are two different things in our world and our culture today. There's a lot of good advice that's out there. I mean, you can watch television programs, you can listen to interviews, you can listen to podcasts, you can read book after book after book, and you can hear tons of different good advices that, advice that is given to people out there to help you improve your life. But really what we're after, if you're a follower of Jesus, is we're after godly advice. We want to know what God says, and we want to do what God says. And that's exactly what Joash has here. Joash has not just someone that's giving him good advice, but someone that's giving him godly advice. And I would ask you in your life right now, the people that are speaking into your life, the people that you're listening to, the people that have your ear, are they people that give you good advice or are they people that give you godly advice? Are they people that just kind of know what's going on in the world and they just are kind of wise? Or are they people that are godly that give you godly wisdom that comes from scripture that gives you direction and purpose and meaning in your life. I think oftentimes we settle for what's good at the expense of going after what is godly. And Jehoiada was a godly influence that gave godly advice to Joash. And without his influence, the things that he was able to accomplish would have never happened. But here's what's so fascinating about the story of Joash is that the story doesn't stop there. In 2 Chronicles 24 at verse 17, we see that Jehoiada has now died. It says, but after Jehoiada's death, the leaders of Judah came and bowed before King Joash and persuaded him to listen to their advice. They decided to abandon the temple of the Lord the God of their ancestors, and they worshiped Asherah poles and idols instead. So there's this drastic change that takes place. He's walking after the Lord. He's following the Lord. He's rebuilding the temple. There's religious reform. There's revival that's happening. All of these things are going very, very well for Joash. He's doing what's pleasing in, his, in the Lord's sight. But then Jehoiada dies. There's an absence of godly voices speaking into his life. And when there's an absence of godly voices speaking into our lives, it opens up the door and an opportunity for others to speak into our lives that might not have our best interest at heart. And so here he is, the king, his main leader, the main guy that was speaking into his life is now gone and a new group of advisors come into the the picture. And here they are giving him advice that goes contrary to God's word, contrary to everything that he's known growing up, contrary to everything that Jehoiada had taught him to be about. His life goal, his life mission, the purpose and the mission that he had chased after to rebuild the temple was suddenly deserted. Now, I could be wrong. I could be reading too much into the text here, but I don't think that I am. I don't think that uh, Joash just suddenly overnight said, well, you know, these people sound like they're smart, so we're just gonna go in this direction, even though for the past, you know, 15, 20, 30 years, however long it is, I've been walking in this direction. But you know what? Bob says that we need to go this direction, so I'm gonna go this direction. He just walks that direction. I don't think that's what happened. I think it was probably a slow, gradual shift where the people began to get him to slowly change, slowly compromise, slowly begin to believe the lies over the truth. And eventually, over years or months, he begins to shift his view in following the ways that went against God rather than following the ways of God. And this is how the enemy ultimately works. When we listen to the wrong voice, voices, ultimate, uh, unlimited destruction is inevitable. Just like we listen to the right voices, there's unlimited potential potential that it's possible. When we listen to the wrong voices, unlimited destruction is inevitable. 
This, this is how the enemy comes into our lives. The, these, these advisors come in and they say, listen, Joash, you've accomplished a lot of great things. And they begin to probably tell him all these great things about himself. And they have words of flattery and they stroke his ego and they talk about how great he is and how handsome he is. And then he brings them into the inner circle and then they begin to slowly shift his way of thinking. They begin to slowly get them to believe something that's different than Jehoiada led him to do. And this is what is happening all over our world today, where it's not an overnight drastic difference, but it's a slow fade to get us to listen to the wrong voices in our lives. And we've got to wake up to this. We've got to recognize this. This is why I'm saying that we've got to evaluate the relationships and the voices that are speaking into our lives, because this is so important. Because whoever has our ear guides our heart. So if we're listening to the wrong voices, if we're listening to the wrong uh, uh, people speaking into us, then we're going to go in the direction that we don't want to go in life. And that's not what God has for us. And this is exactly how the enemy ultimately works. And the enemy I'm talking about is Satan. This is how Satan works. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to bring destruction into our lives. This is how he operates. From the very beginning with Eve in the garden, he doesn't come to Eve and say, hey, take a bite of this fruit and sin's gonna enter the world and tragedy and terrible things are going to unravel as a result. He doesn't say that. He doesn't get her to shift her mindset as a result of this one bite of the apple. But what does he do? It's a slow shift. He says, hey, you're missing out on something. If God knows if you take a bite of this fruit, then man, you're gonna, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna become like him and he doesn't want that. You're missing out on something. And she begins to listen to the voice of the enemy and as she listens to the voice of the enemy, he guides her heart to follow. And this is how the enemy still works in our lives today. He uses ungodly influences that we listen to ungodly voices that we listen to that guide our hearts in directions that we never intended and never wanted to go down in our lives. Think about it. Think about it in your life right now. Some of the worst decisions that you have made, some of the hardest relational conflict that you've experienced have probably been because you listened to the wrong voices and ultimately you reaped the consequences of that. We've been there, right? I've been there. We've all been there. We've all listened to the wrong voices and destruction has come into our lives. And that's what happens in the story of Joash. Whoever has our ear guides our heart. Listen to how wicked it gets for Joash. Verse 19, it says, yet the Lord sent uh, prophets to bring them back to him. The prophets warned them, but still the people would not listen. And so God, in his mercy, even though they're listening to the wrong voices, God is sending prophets to speak and bring the people back, but they're still not listening. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, who was the son of Jehoiada the priest. So this is a direct descendant of Jehoiada, the man that was the father of his, like the, the, the surrogate father, the one that gave his life to see the Joash succeed. This is now his son that's coming into the picture as one of the priests. He stood before the people and said, this is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands and keep yourself from prospering? You have abandoned the Lord and now he has abandoned you. Then the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah and King Joash ordered that they stone him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. That was how King Joash repaid Jehoiada for his loyalty by killing his son. Zechariah's last words as he died were, may the Lord see what they are doing and avenge my death. So this is how drastic of a change that happened for Joash. Walking with the Lord, seeing the temple repaired, seeing religious reform happen, then the wrong advisors come in, speak wrong voices into his mind, and ultimately he begins to not just walk away from the Lord and worshiping pagan idols and gods, but he even has the priests and the prophets of God killed, even the ones that were the descendants of Jehoiada, the man that gave Joash everything the man that was responsible of helping protect him at a young age from his grandmother, even his son, Zachariah, Joash was willing to kill 
because the wrong voices he was listening to, and they guided his heart into a place and into a path of destruction. And now this is a dramatic example that we find in Scripture. And maybe your life doesn't look quite this dramatic, but there are subtle ways that this happens in our life. When somebody comes alongside of us and they give us uh, advice and they give us words that, that really go contrary to God's word, that this is a subtle way of listening to the wrong voices. And there's a lot of well-intentioned, good people out there that will be willing to give you advice. And they mean well, and they have good hearts. But unless it lines up with the word of God, then we're subtly drifting, and we're listening to the wrong voices in our life. This is why it's so important, so important, for us to make sure that we have the right voices speaking into us. Because there's a lot of people that will be willing to fill our mind with things. There's a lot of people that will be willing to tell us what we need to do, the decisions that we need to make, the relationships that we need to have. But God is telling us, man, you need to listen to the right people. Surround yourself with the right people that can give you godly advice, that can lead you into unlimited potential. It comes into our minds. It comes into our, our ways, into subtle ways, like you picking up bad habits and destructive habits where you just slowly begin to think, well, this isn't going to hurt anybody. And then, you know, it kind of becomes more and more and the ball becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and it rolls down the hill. It's like the snowball effect. This happens all the time, right? Just take lying, for example, where, where it's so easy for us to go, well, you know, it's just one little kind of white lie to protect ourselves, to, to make it look like we didn't really do something as bad as it really was or that makes us look better than we really are. Just a white lie. No one's going to get hurt from this. And we do it once, and then it comes again, and then it comes again until it's just easy. It's just easy for us to do that. That's slowly listening to the wrong voices that ultimately leads to destruction in our life. When you are going down the wrong path and you are having uh, people in your life that aren't having difficult conversations with you, much like the girl I was talking about at the very beginning of this message, that we don't have people that surround us and go, hey, Nathan, wake up. You're going in the wrong direction. You need to change what you're doing. You need to change the influences that are speaking into your life. Wake up to that. If we don't have those people in our lives, then we subtly, ever so slightly, drift off the path that God has for us in life. When we come to a place where we get off mission to what God has called us to do, now, this is a big one. I think a lot of times this is such an easy drift for us to make where we fall into the trap of thinking that our life is all about comfort. It's all about pleasure. It's all about what we can get from this life. And God says, no, it's about the mission that I've given you. It's about the purpose of your life and what I'm calling you to, the purpose of the church, the global mission, that we wanna be missionaries that are sent out to spread the love and the message of Jesus to the world around us. And we can so easily drift from that if we don't have the right voices speaking into us because our culture and our world will tell us something that's drastically different from what God's word tells us. This is why it's so important for us to have godly advice, to us to have godly counsel, for us to have men and women that are speaking godly truth into our lives. When we talk about biblical community, we are not talking about people just getting together and hanging out. It's good that you have friends. It's good that you have people that you can confide in. It's good that you have friends in your life that you can have fun with. That's great. But what we're talking about here this morning and in community groups, we're talking about a community that is giving us godly counsel, godly advice, that's loving for us, praying for us, that's giving us their life as we're giving us them our life and we're shepherding and being with one another for the glory of God and for the purpose of unlimited potential and breakthrough in our lives. That's what unlimited, that's what God in, in um, small groups and what he ultimately wants to do in our lives, that whoever has our ear guides our heart. Now, I love um, Church at the Grove, and I love 
so many stories that we could have shared, um, but one of the stories that uh, just recently kind of came to our attention was um, from Taylor. And if you're here at our social circle campus, uh, Taylor is uh, in charge of our uh, children's ministry here, and uh, she does a fantastic job. She just started a few months ago, and her story is a story about how she got connected to a group of godly ladies, and as a result, it changed her life and gave her a purpose and mission that she was missing out on. And so I want us just to take a moment and listen to Taylor's story this morning. I'm Taylor Parsons. Um, My family and I moved up here to Georgia two years ago from Florida. So we landed here. We had first moved to Covington and um, we knew we needed to find a church. And it was quite the experience. We went to quite a few, never felt like we belonged or it was the one for us. Um, One Sunday we came to Church of the Grove here in Social Circle. And right away we could tell that there was something different about this place. It was so friendly and welcoming. Uh, The Kids Grove area is kind of really what drew us in. We have two small girls, five and two, and we just were welcomed with open arms and the atmosphere was great. So we stayed, I think we got to come all of three times before COVID happened and it was shut down. All throughout COVID though, we attended online as much as we could. And um, during that time, Chelsea was in charge of Kids Grove and she reached out to us so many times, wrote letters to our girls and that just really stuck with me because she didn't know us and she definitely didn't have to do that, but it made us feel like we were welcomed and that they um, really had cared about us. Once the church opened back up, we knew we wanted to get plugged in and we knew we needed a community. Um, Moving from state to a new state, not knowing anybody, it was really hard being isolated for a few months, not having any friends, not having anything to do, anywhere to go. So I came one night to a Thrive meeting, which I thought was gonna be like the first kickoff Thrive meeting. And it was like kind of the behind the scenes Thrive meeting of, volunteering to serve and so when I walked in I was like I'm definitely not supposed to be here but it all turned out that I was supposed to be here and God knew exactly what he was doing put me here at the right time I met a lot of ladies and um, I was kind of just telling them our story about how we moved here and they had invited me to a small group on Wednesday mornings that was just moms and I kind of brushed it off I was like "Eh, I don't know like I'm not someone who goes out of my comfort zone and makes friends like my husband does all the talking for us and he makes all of our friends and so I knew I definitely did not want to go to somebody's house that I didn't know and have to talk for myself. So um, long story short, God did a lot of uh, convicting on my heart and I went one Wednesday morning to Caitlin Boyd's house and it was a life changing experience and I'm so glad that I went. Um, Just Wednesday after Wednesday, the study that we did, it just changed my life. The Wednesday morning Bible study, it was a group of moms. They had kids all similar ages, dropping them off at school. Some were with us. And um, I just really felt like we're all in the same stage. And that was something that was so, so important to me. It was like finding moms who knew what you're going through. There's one Wednesday I'll never forget and I'm sitting there just in tears crying, which was oftentimes a lot of Wednesdays. But this one particular Wednesday, I was just like, I don't feel like I know my purpose. And um, so many of the moms around us were like, we've been there, we know what you're going through. Once again, not only did God put me in this community of women, but like, like-minded women who have also walked the same path or similar path that I have gone through. And so I just felt like I could really connect with them because they knew kind of what I was struggling with um, in a sense. And so it really helped being around them and just hearing their wisdom and how they've traveled these roads and what they've done and just having people pray for you. Honestly, that's the biggest thing is these are the people I know I can go to and be like, hey, can you pray for this? And I know it'll be prayed for. I don't think we would have made it through COVID without finding community groups. I've said it so many times, like isolation was hard. Typically I'm one to just be by myself, 
but when you're forced to be by yourself, you realize how much you really need to be around other people. And um, I'm so thankful for the groups that we've been plugged into and the people that we've met and the relationships that we've built because that's really what it's all about. It's just building those relationships and, and doing life with those people. Yeah, I love that. I love Taylor's story. And that's just one story out of many that we could tell of the difference that people have made, small groups of people that have made in individuals' lives. And that's what it's really about. Um, we want people to connect and we want people to value community, community groups, to have intentional biblical community in their lives and live in that. That we would have people in our lives that give us godly counsel, godly wisdom, and that we would walk in that. And so our challenge this morning and really this whole entire series has been get in a community group. And if you can't get in one of our community groups here, then find it somewhere else. If you're watching online, we'd love to invite you into one of these physical gatherings. But if you don't even live here, we'd love for you to find it somewhere else. We want people to connect in biblical community where people are opening up the scriptures together. They're praying for one another and godly wisdom is being distributed. This is where breakthrough happens in our lives. Whoever has your ear guides your heart. And sadly, I think for many of us, the people that are speaking into our lives are not guiding us into the direction that God would ultimately have us to go. And let's just be honest. Um, our community groups are filled with imperfect people. And just because you hear something in a community group doesn't mean that it's the right advice or that it's godly advice even. But this is the thing that we wrestle with when it comes to our community group. There's two questions that we try to impress on our group leaders to go through each and every time they meet is what is God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? What is God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? And if we'll wrestle with those questions, and we'll have people in our life that will help us walk through those questions, then I believe that we can listen to the right voices in our life, the voice of our Heavenly Father, and we can go into the path of unlimited potential and breakthrough into our lives, that we can walk into the way that is prospering, the way of Jesus, the way that is full of abundant life. This is what Jesus calls us into, but it starts with us opening ourselves up to listening to godly influence, godly voices that are speaking into us. Because remember, whoever has our ear guides our heart. So who has your ear? Who's speaking into your life? If you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, then what does that mean for the future of your life? Many of our, many people in today's world are frustrated in life. Many people are disappointed at where they have ended up in life. And I think that a lot of times it's because we've listened to the wrong voices and we've gone down the paths that we didn't intend to go. Let that not be said of us. Let us not be a people that, that just get content going through the motions, but let us strive to be people that hear the right voices and follow after those voices in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. But before we kind of close out our service this morning, I would say that the most important voice that we could listen to is the voice of Jesus. Obviously, that's the most important voice that we could ever listen to more than any human wisdom. We need God's voice to speak to us. And so for some of you, maybe you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus. And today would be the day that you could start making that decision and you could put your faith and your trust wholly and completely in him if he's calling you this morning into salvation, if he's calling you to, 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 to put your uh, hope and your trust in him, then man, don't mess, miss this opportunity, but give him your life this morning. Here at Church of the Grove, we say it's as simple as the ABCs. It's admit, believe, and confess, that we admit we're sinful. We believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He died on a cross for our sins and then rose again on the third day. And then we confess him as our Lord and Savior. And if that's the step that you need to take this morning, man, we would invite you into that. And we would love to give you tools to help you walk into a new relationship with Jesus. And so you can see us on your way out this morning for some resources. But you can also, if you're watching online, you can text start to follow all one word to 97000. And we'll be able to follow up with you this week and give you the resources that can help you grow in your relationships. 
But for the rest of us that have a relationship with Jesus, let it not stop there, but let us value intentional biblical community and let us strive after that so that we hear the right voices and that that will guide our heart into unlimited potential for our lives. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are and for what you have done. Lord, we thank you for your word and for your truth and that you are a God that is a God that um, surrounds us with intentional biblical community. And Lord, I pray that we would value those things in our lives, that we would strive to have those types of relationships in our lives today, that it wouldn't be something we put off, but it would be something that we make a priority for in our life because you want us to experience breakthrough. You want us to hear the godly advice and you want us to have unlimited potential in our grips. And so Lord, I pray that we would walk in that. I pray that we would walk in the ways that you have called us to walk, that we would be willing to get in a small group, a community of other believers that are challenging each other, holding each other accountable, and they're walking together and following you. And so, Lord, give us the grace, give us the courage, give us the boldness to do that this morning. We love you. We thank you so much for just this gift that you have given us. And it's in your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.